I, w I am really pleased to introduce George Davis, as Ken calls him the rock star CEO of Tetco. Tetco is Maryland's economic engine for technology companies. Its mission, led by George, is to create and grow technology-based businesses throughout Maryland. George joined Tetco in June 2017, boasting more than 30 years of investing, building, and managing successful companies within the biotech, IT, and software industries. In his first year at Tetco, George has helped entrepreneurs develop their startup companies through entrepreneurial business assistance and seed funding. Under his guidance, Tetco recently added companies to its seed portfolio, totaling $600,000 in new investments for tech and life science startups. Nicknamed an entrepreneur's entrepreneur by former Tetco chairman, Newt Fowler, George embodies Tetco's mission of supporting small businesses, including tech startups, and making Maryland's innovation ecosystem something all Marylanders can be proud of. According to George, building strong relationships with all of the innovation ecosystem constituencies and leveraging the unprecedented footprint and pedigree of the state's academic research facilities is paramount to our success. He garners his exper expertise from sea level acumen and a history of successful investment and operational engagements within the Maryland innovation ecosystem. Most recently, George served as CEO of Gemstone Biotherapeutics, founded in conjunction with John Hopkins University to develop innovative, high efficiency, effective evidence-based wound care solutions. He also served as partner with Gamma 3 LLC, a Maryland-based investment platform which provides early stage financing to locally based startups. While there, George guided investments in Maryland companies. I would like for us please have a warm welcome for George. Thank you. Thank you, Inez, appreciate it. So George, thank you so much for your support of our program over the years. And um, you're one of those, you are an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. I, I love that you know, moniker that you have. And you, have the, you are one of these rare individuals who have lots of experience as an investor, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, life sciences, technology. Um, why don't we start by talking about your background? You know, where sure. you're from, where you went to school, how sure, you got on? into technology, et cetera. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be here. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, we were just here 48 hours ago, weren't we, Mike, with, with about 800 people. Um, pretty exciting place. So yeah, um, quick background on how I ended up at uh, running this public corporation, which is all new to me. So I'm from the private sector my entire career. So, so I grew up in Maryland. I'm an Arbutus guy. Um, started my career um, actually in West Virginia, uh, selling computers for a company then known as Burroughs Corporation, which became Unisys over the years. You were selling computers, not software. I was selling computers. Bill, pay attention to that. I was selling computers to coal miners in 1979. I had, I had to find something else to do. So I moved back to Maryland um, and got a job at Westinghouse Electric, uh, now the Electronic Systems Group of Northrop Grumman. So for 16 years, I was worked for a very large and innovative advanced technology company known as Westinghouse. And I learned to build radar systems. Um, at that time, I saw, you know, you talk about innovation through your life and through the cycle of time. I went into Westinghouse at a time when they were just transferring from analog to digital systems. Wow. And it was amazing to see the power of what you could do for advanced weapon systems, computing, um, the power of writing software algorithms. Uh, it was an amazing venture, amazing people I worked with. Um, I worked my way up to being a program manager. I managed a, a series of F-16 projects, F-16 radar, we sold them around the world. I uh, learned a lot, worked with some really smart people, both in the software and mechanical engineering side, as well as manufacturing. So it was a great experience. In 1996, I got recruited to go to my first startup. 
So a contemporary and friend of mine at Westinghouse had left. He had some ideas about this crazy world called mobile and wireless computing back in the mid-90s. So he started a company that became Aether Systems. He recruited me to come with him. I went over, we had about 10 employees. And we were trying to, we were trying to do this back in 96, 95. We were trying to do it over packet data networks. We were doing it on Palm Pilots with modems and Microsoft CE devices. But it was an exciting time. First of all, we had a great team. Second of all, it was something called the dot com was happening. So we were right in the middle of that. Um, and, and I'll never forget, we built a pretty cool company. We had some really strong applications focused on financial sector, transportation. And Dave, the founder of the company, called me one 4th of July in, in 97, 98 and said, you know, we got to go public. I thought he was out of his mind, right? Um, dot com, we had some good momentum. We had some good marquee customers like Charles Schwab and Merrill Lynch. We were doing some financial trading apps. We had a, a back end connection to a Reuters data feed. So we got on a train and we went to, went to New York, right? And, and, and figured out this whole, this whole capital play. Um, at the same time, we had some investors and partners in Silicon Valley. So we flew back and forth to Silicon Valley and I saw this, this unbelievable power of capital and innovation coming together to create great companies back in the late 90s. Um, we went to New York to go public. You get interviewed by a bunch of bankers. Um, one of those bankers happened to be a fraternity brother of mine from Merrill Lynch who, who ran their capital markets group and institutional sales force at the time. His name's Bob McCann. He's now the chairman of UBS Americas. Um, Bob threatened to show stories or pictures of me from our fraternity days if we didn't pick Merrill Lynch, so, so we chose them. And, uh, and off we went, you know, and what, a, what an unbelievable run. Um, so we put our story together, hit the road, flying across the country. Uh, to show you how crazy the world was back then, along our journey, you kind of followed other companies that were going public. And you just got on the same record, the same tract. And usually right before us was Martha Stewart going public. And right after us was wow. Vince McMahon, World, World Wrestling Federation. It was unbelievable. And here's this tech company right between them. Anyway, we raised about $100 million in a public offering. Went out, our stock was, I think on day one, started off at $14. Uh, at the end of that day, it was $50. Within six months, it was $300 a share. Um, it was an insane market back then, as you remember. Um, we, were, we had a value on our business of almost $7 billion, and I think we were maybe doing $80 million in sales. Um, so it was pretty insane. It was, it, it was frightening, it was exciting, all things combined. But in, in 2000, or late, late 99, early 2000, same guy called me again, my boss. He said, we gotta go do a secondary. Again, I said, you're crazy. He said, George, this isn't gonna last. You know, we, we gotta go get capital while we can. So Merrill Lynch agreed, we got back on a plane. This time we went over the world. And we raised one and a half billion dollars in the public sector at about $200 a share. Um, to show you how crazy the world was back then, I remember our last stop was Janus. You know, Janus funds out in Denver. And we walked in and they knew us very well, but they did not participate in the original offering. So they were very thirsty to get in. We walked in, they didn't want to see the pitch. They knew us. They said, George, we want to buy it all. We want to buy the entire secondary. I said, well, that's not going to happen. But they made a big purchase. Um, two weeks after we closed that deal, and a lot of insiders were able to sell during that secondary offering. Two weeks later, the markets collapsed. Literally, the dot-com busted. And that $200 stock was very quickly a $100 stock, and within a year it was a $40 stock. Um, we had cash, we had capital. Uh, we built several really cool divisions in, in mobile and wireless, very high-end enterprise applications, financial sector, transportation. We were one of the first ones to put laptops in police cars uh, across the country. So we were doing some heavy lifting. Our board of directors, which had some very well-known people on our board, people like Frank Bonzel and Chuck Newhall, some of the founders of NEA, um, decided that the best thing for us to do was to sell off the divisions in 2002, 2003. We did that. Then I moved on. Learned a lot on the upside there. We had a lot of fun. Probably learned more on the downside about how to manage people, how to manage a business, how to manage expectations. You know, because wh when we were raising money, it was nothing but momentum, right? It was momentum investors. And the day the market crashed, the same people called me and said, can you create value? Can you get profitable? We were burning $20 million a quarter. I, I, I didn't know how to do that. So, so it was a very interesting time. Um, but I moved on. I took a little time off, and then I was recruited to run another public company called Avitech, 
which was a small reseller of computer aid design software products and services. Our, our big partner was Autodesk. So this was the evolution of the advanced CAD product business. I, I walked into a small company that was maybe doing 60, 70 million in sales. It was in the public sector, did not belong there. Somehow it had gotten there. And I was struggling to figure out how to create value with it. Um, we didn't have a big engineering team or a lot of capital to spend, so I said, generate a lot of cash, right? Create value. So we, we made it very profitable. And then I was able to merge it with a partner company out of Canada uh, called, called Rand Worldwide. That's now called Rand Worldwide, and it's one of the biggest purveyors of computer-aided software across the country. Um, I probably would have continued to run that for a while, but I took a time out to go learn about life sciences. So I became a cancer patient in 2009. Um, I thought I'd be off the grid for about six months. Turned into about three and a half, four years. Um, but got through it, obviously. Uh, tough run, learned a lot of perspective. Um, having cancer for four years and being out of the market cost a lot of money, had to get back to work. Um, went back with my old partner, Dave, and we started Gamma 3, which was a small investment platform up in Baltimore, focused on investing in very early seed tech companies. And we did a lot of attention to tech transfer. So we did a lot of work with Hopkins, a lot with Maryland. We, we ended up funding seven businesses. Um, three we actually started. Uh, all of them were life science except for one, a cyber company called Terbium Labs, which is doing very well. Uh, Gemstone was one of those companies. I took that over running that, kind of oversaw that portfolio. We were early, early investors in PGDX up in Baltimore, which I'll talk about a little bit here later on. Uh, they're all doing really well, knock on wood. So about a year and a half ago, um, I'm man that, managing that portfolio, running our company, and some people approached me and asked if I would consider running this, this platform called Tedco. And I looked at them and I told the board when I met with them, as I said, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so it obviously has a branding issue. Um, you know, I've been in the system for a long time and I wasn't quite sure what it was other than a public state funding agency. So w when I looked under the hood and looked at the platform, I got pretty excited. You know, 20 years ago, the General Assembly of Maryland had the wherewithal to think about putting capital and resource into transferring technology. A as Mike said earlier, we yield to no one here when it comes to assets particularly on the research side. You know, more research money flows through this zip code in this region than any place in the world, probably on a yearly basis if you add up all the federal labs and, 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 and the academic institutions. Yet, why do we have such a wide gap in access to venture capital and commercialization of that technology compared to other regions? So Tedco was all about trying to change that over time. Um, so it built over the years a series of programs, had different capital added on to it, uh, did some early stage stuff, some seed things, Several years ago, the Maryland Venture Fund was transferred to Tedco, uh, and, and they hired Andy Jones to run that. Um, so I looked at it, I said, this is a really cool platform. It's just, damn, it's just not big enough. You know, it's significantly undercapitalized. You know, we, we get funded from the state probably anywhere from 20 to $25 million a year, which if you think about it, is not that much money to do what we're trying to do. Um, we also manage federal money. Uh, we have a little bit of private sector money, but mostly, mostly that. So I, I went in and I looked at it, and the board asked me to try to look at synthesizing private and public sector DNAs. You know, Legacy Tedco was really run by more public sector people, good strong people, very passionate. Um, Andy Jones came in with a venture fund that was very private sector oriented. And it was kind of like oil and vinegar, you know, oil and water. Um, so I was asked to do that. Um, and let me tell you, synthesizing public and private sector DNA is not an easy thing to do. Um, but we're getting there. You know, we looked at that and said, Right out of the gate, I said, you know, we have to prove to the world that investing for ROI and investing for economic development do not have to be diametrically opposed, right? If we find great companies and build great companies, everybody wins. So that's kind of our mantra, and we're trying to move in that direction. But I looked at the tools we had at Tedco, and I said they're outdated, they're old. If we want to be an engine that supports innovation, dang it, we better be innovative ourselves. So we recreated. So we have two major operating platforms now at Tedco. One we call Tech Transfer and Gateway Services. So we manage tech transfer funds from the state of Maryland. We have the Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund, which we get about eight or nine million a year, has been very focused on research of cell and advanced cell therapies, starting to show some commercial power now, which is great. And as a cancer survivor, I'm very excited about immunotherapy and cell therapies. Uh, we manage the Maryland Innovation Initiative Fund, which is about a $5 million a year pocket of money that's destined for working with the university systems to give that, that money needed to do a business plan, to do that last test, to move a product or a technology towards a commercial flavor. 
Um, so between those two, it's almost $14 million a year. It's pretty impactful money. We then had a series of lift-up programs to support entrepreneurs and innovators. And they had been outdated and, and, and getting kind of stale, mentoring, training. So we redid them. And I said, let's partner, let's collaborate, let's be more virtual. And we just recently rolled out what we call Gateway Services, which is kind of a concierge of products to help entrepreneurs. We have assessment tools. We have training and mentoring tools. One of our most popular programs is something called Executive Exchange Program, where we actually pay for executives to go into startups and help them. Doing very, very well in this space. And we recently added a fund in that field called, it was a pre-seed fund, it's now called the Builder Fund. What we saw when I came in and they were already looking at it, we need to be more inclusive with our money. Uh, there's some people being left behind, particularly minorities, women in businesses. So we have a particular fund focused on that. The pre-seed fund was focused on African-American startups, trying to give that friends and family money, $50,000 grants. We, were able to, we, we raised about $400,000 to support that. So we could do 10, 10 or so grants. We had 400 applications. Talk about being undercapitalized. So this year we've added some more money to it. It's about 700,000 and it's targeting all minority, women-owned, veteran businesses. And we've added a couple hundred grand on top of that to provide support, place to sit, mentoring, training. And I've just asked the state for some additional money. So Mike knows how that game plays, but we'll see what we can get there. So, so that's there. And then the other side of the column is our, is our venture funds. So we have the Maryland Venture Fund. Techco had a series of seed funds where we get about four to five million a year to invest in early stage businesses. Um, that was being managed by the legacy Tedco team. I put that under Andy Jones and the venture team to bring that acumen down to that level with the intent to make sure that we're investing in opportunities that have the most sustainability opportunity. Um, I have limited capital. I take very seriously the stewardship of my neighbor's money. I spend taxpayer money. We want to create businesses that, that are built to last. So, so we're working in syndicated deals. I think we probably did 27 deals in that space last year where we averaged about two to $250,000 per investment, but the syndicated deal was about one and a half million. So much more sustainable opportunities that we're driving out there. A lot of cyber, a lot of life science, as you can imagine here. The Maryland Venture Fund is legacy. It's about a hundred million dollar asset that was started about eight or nine years ago. Um, we've got about 10 million in powder there. We're going to get some more, hopefully, with some turnarounds this year. And then recently, we started a new fund called the Maryland Innovation Opportunity Fund, where we're managing $25 million of state pension money to invest in venture. So obviously, this has to be driven by IRR and ROI. And we've done some great deals in that space. So a new look and feel, new website, new energy, great team. And I also figured we've got to work smarter and better with our partners in the ecosystem starting with commerce. You know, and Mike and I have formed a great relationship, and Steve and the team, we're doing a lot of great things with them. Uh, we're working with Maryland Tech Council very closely, BioHealth Innovation, and obviously with all the universities. So it's been a great ride. You know, and as Mike said, I, I, I told people the other day, I put 35,000 miles on my car last year, driving around Maryland. And everywhere I go is innovation. What's missing is stronger innovation infrastructure. Risk capital, placemaking, commercial data centers, talent recruitment and development, and we're trying to focus more energy in those spaces. So other than Mike, I think I have the coolest job in Maryland. You know, our, our mission is pretty cool. Our mission is to foster innovation and entrepreneurship across the state and also find, fund, and help develop great companies that stay in last year. I'll end with this. One of our, one of our investment partners is Ron and Cindy Gula, founders of Tenable, and I've become very good friends with Ron. And he sits in my office and we talk about a mission. And that mission is, how do we go build 10 tenables? If we do that, everybody wins. It's 10,000 jobs. It's great thought leadership. So having a great time. Really enjoyed it. Glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, you've done and a great job. Been. That's where I've been. Yeah, fantastic. Let's give it up. You've done a heck of a job in, what, about a year? A little over a year? And, uh, Somewhere the, between a year and 20 years, it year. feels like. You know, <laughs> the yeah. rebrand is great. The website is great. I think the new focus is great. Um, you mentioned tech transfer, and I, we have a lot of people in the room involved in tech transfer, and, you know, with, and you've got a lot of experience. Maybe I'd like to ask you know, if you were to give some advice. And you know, we, as, as a state, have not cracked the code the way some of our friends out west have done. I think we have a long way to go. We have so much talent, as Mike said earlier, in this, in this region. There's no excuse why we're not producing a lot of unicorns, more unicorns. But if you had to give some advice to the folks involved in tech transfer, maybe two or three things that 
how do you facilitate, make easier the ability to take these great inventions and, and make them marketable? It's a great question. And, and, and bear with me on the answer, particularly people in tech transfer. Um, I did several tech transfer programs, and, and, te and I transferred technology out of Hopkins and Maryland for some of our startups. And trust me, at times I thought I would rather drive a railroad spike through the middle of my forehead than do it again, because it's hard. It's hard work on both sides of that aisle. You know, you look at our, our university system here, Maryland and Hopkins, and they are great, fantastic research institutions, and they've been built on that premise. You know, you look at a place like Johns Hopkins University, one of the greatest research institutions in the world. So over the time and period in their history, they recruit research people, right? They didn't have the, they didn't have the advantage of, you know, so many years ago, the U.S. government investing in Stanford to move technology forward and, and help create Silicon Valley. So, so we have this, in our community in Maryland, and, and, and I think the capital region to some extent, you know, what we have here is a very government sector oriented mindset at times. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. We garnish a lot of income and a lot of jobs from that. But with that comes an attitude, a little bit of process orientation and risk avoidance. And we need to change that, yeah. right? We need, you, you know that better than anybody, Tanya. So, you know, John Doerr, the founder of Kleiner Perkins, always talks about Silicon Valley in the spirit of don't look at it as a geographical footprint, look at it as a mindset. You know, a mindset of not being afraid to fail, a mindset of surrounding your startups and, and growing them. We're moving in that direction. When I see the gallon efforts by people like Julie Lenzer down here at College Park and Jim Hughes up at UMB and Christy Weichsel at Hopkins, they've got the mindset. They're just trying to turn a pretty big ship yes. right in the right direction. If we can surround them with more access to early stage capital and risk capital, innovation infrastructure, and incubators and accelerators, I think we can all win. Because the technology's there, the assets are there. It's a mindset shift that I think we're starting to see. You're starting yes. to feel it, you know, the buzz. I, I, I said the other day, I don't think there's a better time in the history of Maryland to be an entrepreneur than there is right now. It's starting, the, 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 the thing's starting to turn. We're starting to become fearless, yeah. you know, and, and I can't wait to see the next 10 years of what we're gonna explore here. Yeah, that's great. And as far as investments go, so congrats on the $25 million fund. That sounds very exciting. Um, are we going to be selling more bonds? I mean, how are we going to keep that MVF, Maryland Venture Fund, evergreen? Well, you know, um, there, there, there's a couple, How big do we want to make it? How big there's do you a couple, We're always it? vying for capital, right? And always vying for money. And, and we're trying to figure out a way to prove, like I said, that, that investing for ROI and economic development don't have to be counterproductive. Right. And, and, and really, just like anything, capital finds winners, right? I mean, people are always asking me about, we need more capital, we need more capital. Produce more winners, right? Because capital has an uncanny ability to find winners. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and venture capital, in particular, um, likes to sleep in its own bed. It doesn't travel as well as bankers. So how do we do more winners here to attract more venture capital here? And, and, and some things are happening in that space. So in addition to our funds, team, we're trying to find other partners to come into the region. Great announcement uh, a couple weeks ago up in Baltimore at Port Covington with Allegis Cyber and Bob Ackerman, going to bring his shop from Silicon Valley here and set up 20 people based in Baltimore doing investing. These are the type of things we're really excited about seeing. You know, when you talk about finding partners in capital, I always reflect on a funny story I had. Right before I was going to take the job at Tech, or I was thinking about it, I was down at NEA. I was talking with Justin Klein down there, a good friend of mine. I had introduced him to some companies up in Baltimore. I asked him about Tedco, and he said, oh, that's that funding thing. That's, I think that's the word he used, thing, up in Maryland. And I said, we're in Maryland. <laughs> I was sitting in his office at Bethesda. I said, we're in Maryland. Yeah. So it's a mindset thing. It's, it, it, but we're always trying, you know, I'm, believe me, on a daily basis, on a regular basis, I'm in Annapolis trying to solicit more money. You get more money when you perform. Yes. You know, so we want to, you know, the, it, last year the, the, the General Assembly worked with the pension system who gave us $25 million to get them to commit another $75 million a year over the next three years to go into a similar type space relative to venture investing. Now, they don't have to move that in one year. It's over time. But they're already looking at NMIOF2 with us. They're t and I said, hey, don't do it all with us. Do it with private sector. Right. right? So they're working with some local and national private venture funds to, to co-fund them. Imagine what they would do. They may give a, a particular fund $40 million. I mean, this is a $40 billion fund at the pension system. But they may say you've got to target $10 million of that to invest in the region. So, so some things like that are going on. We've got to find more capital. Trust me, we're trying to do it.
Any hot exits coming up, by the way, in terms of you can't talk about. Okay, what we we've had some good ones, you know. In the last since I've been at Tedco, we've actually because previous Tedco wasn't having a lot of exits because the investment philosophy was a little different than what we're doing now. But just in the last year, um, a year ago, you know, Harpoon Medical got acquired by Edward Life Sciences. That was a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment from our venture fund. Got a check for five and a half million bucks, right? And there's still more to come. That's venture investing. How do we get them on a regular basis so this, and everything we do is evergreen, so how can we put that right back into the system to run? Um, we had a small cyber company that flipped on us in six months, Atata, right? You know, we put 200 grand in, got 650 back, you know? Um, there's a couple things in our MIOF space. So when we got the Maryland Innovation Opportunity Fund, Andy Jones and his team were thinking forward about warehousing some deals that would be beneficial to that level of IRR return. So he did some investments in some really cool companies down here like Optoro, Stay in Touch. Uh, some of these are gonna be really high flyers. And one of them was PGDX. And I can't say enough about PGDX. I was an early investor in them. It's Personal Genome Diagnostics. They're based in Baltimore. Two brilliant scientists out of Hopkins who worked under Bert Vogel's team, which is the most, you know, quoted where we now cancer expert in the world. Um, they started this company focused on genome sequencing, blood biopsying, diagnostic tools for, for, for really tracking cancer. I'm a big fan, obviously. In fact, Luis Diaz, one of the founders, was one of my oncologists, so I knew him pretty well. Um, they, you know, this is how it works in the life science world and how it should work. So, so they, they moved out, they put some of their own money in it, they got it going, brilliant mindset, technology. Early days in the seed level, they only raised about two and a half million bucks. It was, our, it was our Gamma 3 portfolio. The Able Foundation put some money in, some angels. And then we watched them. I saw how well they were doing. There was this company out of MIT called Foundation Medicine that was a rocket ship in, in the genome sequencing area, valued at several billion. I talked to the founders. I said, guys, you know, you could be a billion dollar business, or you could be 100 million. And they said, what's the difference? I said, to be a billion, you probably got to get out of the way. You know, we're going to have to probably bring different leadership in here. They got it. I introduced NEA to them. NEA did a $25 million Series A raise. Then NEA used their Rolodex to recruit a C-level team to come in who had great experience, Doug Ward. He brought his team into Baltimore. They raised $80 million last year. They've hired 300 people in the last year and a half. And they're creating a manufacturing facility up in Baltimore. This is success, right? That, success. that has a chance to be one of our first unicorns in a long, long time in the Maryland area from a life science perspective. So, so we're, you know, I talked to Andy and the team, you know, Andy's my partner, he runs the venture fund. We're seeing really strong deal flow. We really are. We get prohibited sometimes and limited on what we can do. I have discovered wearing this public sector suit that's kind of tight, that, that regulation and innovation don't necessarily make for good bedfellows, um, but we're trying to work our way through that. Yeah, I want to plug Top Box too, which I think oh, is yeah. a, a hot company you guys have funded, and they just closed a five million dollar round. So, congrats on that success. Um, personal question: You've you've uh, you've obviously always been a very hard charging, Type A successful business leader, and you still are. How has going through the ordeal that you went through, um, the health cancer, changed your perspective on business and you know your approach to? Uh, yeah, you've always been a, a CEO investor, but how, how has that changed you? Well, it's, it's a great question because it's changed me dramatically. You know, it's part of my life. Um, it's part of my story. I actually had two cancers, by the way. Um, but, um, you know, going through that process is, is a very difficult one, emotionally, personally, physically. Um, I, I gained perspective more than anything. And I gained perspective on, and, and it relates now to a, to a book that I recommend everyone read in business by John Doerr called Measure What Matters. Right, um, and, and it is about really trying to realize and remember every day what really matters in your life and in your business and what you do. Um, and, and, and as hard, as hard charging you're gonna be as an entrepreneur, an inventor, and an innovator, don't forget about the important things in your life. But you know the other thing it taught me, team, was about, about patience. Um, had to be very patient to go what I went through, but at the same time, I'm not a very patient person because I know how precious and short life can be, right? Um, and, and, and I can't tell you how frustrated I get in, in, the, in the life science search, research world, move faster, you know? Uh, you know, I look at cancer research, for example, very closely every day for obvious reasons. Um, and, I, and I watched an, an, an industry and institution that for 50, 60 years 
believed they could solve the cancer model by dip building a synthetic drug that would kill it, and they never got there, right? And, and now all of a sudden, immunotherapy is upon us, and I'm thrilled, right? Because I went through the evils of the triad of previous cancer uh, treatment, which is they kind of, they fry you first with radiation, and then they mutilate you with some surgery, and then they poison you with chemo, right? So, so this new immunotherapy concept I'm thrilled with, I'm excited about it, it's gotta move faster, but if you think about it, if you think about the essence of immunotherapy, it's Eastern medicine at its best, right? Okay. It, it's, it's actually teaching the body and recognizing the power of the body to do it. So I don't have any patience when it comes to moving the needle things on faster. So perspective and balanced patience is probably the two things I learned through that ordeal. Fantastic. So you're more on fire than ever. Absolutely. I mean, it, obviously, I like great. Steve Jobs, you know, the guys that have gone I through a lot, they, they really start I learned, I don't know if there are people in the audience know the term NED. Um, but it's called no evidence of disease. And it's what you get when you do your test and everything looks good, and I keep getting that. So it's become a very powerful three letters in my life and a lot of people's lives that I deal with. So yeah. we're well, here. Congrats on that. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions for George uh, from the audience. Um, if anyone has any burning or you know, pressing things they want to ask, don't be shy. Okay, speak up, please. Dennis? Thank you for, for sharing your so the question is from Dennis Defenser. Um, why should companies stay here as opposed to going to out west? Sure. Great, great question. And you know, um, about a year ago, Governor Hogan commissioned a study up, up in Maryland um, called Excel Maryland. And I was part of that. A group of us looked at what, why do we have such this gap in, in, in the plethora? First of all, and part of, part of the Part of the answer to your question is the asset base we hear, have here is phenomenal. Tech talent is just unbelievable in, the, in this sector. But, but why do we have these gaps? And, and, and a lot of things we looked at came back to this, we need to spend more, invest more, do more private-public partnerships to create innovation infrastructure, the things that lift up the entrepreneur and the innovator. Um, and, that some of the, and then we did some roundtables with commerce, we did some roundtables with the cyber community, you know, we did some roundtables with the life science community, which are areas where we think we have tremendous promise. How do we move that to prominence, right? And, and, and then we and then talked to the venture community. You know, why don't you invest more here? So, so they talked to, the venture community talked about thing, produce more winners, right? Where, where's the deal flow? Where's the exit? So we're doing that. We're creating winners. That's, it's, it's an ecosystem built. The talent side of it's interesting. You know, you know, my view of the world, and I think we shared this in these studies, was we are, and you are, our story. And we have not done a very good job of telling our story. You know, we, we tend to accentuate negatives in, in this area when we have so much good and so much power. So much research asset, tech talent asset, geographical footprint is unbelievable here, cost of living is unbelievable here. And, and, and that's been known to some of you as we speak, our friends at Commerce have billboards in places like Boston and Silicon Valley talking about that. So we're getting aggressive on, on, on the rationale to bring people here, but why you should stay here, I think because there's a mindset forming that you can be on the front end of here that's gonna garner state support, capital region support, enterprise support. One of the biggest things we're trying to do is stand up a new op platform and opportunity that will garner private public investing together, a new fund that will focus on investing in infrastructure, commercial centers, talent recruitment, workforce development. There's some great things going on. There really are. So, so I, I'm seeing it every day how things are moving in the right direction. I mean, I, I'm biased. I love it here. You know, I love the region. I love the air. We had this conversation with Steve Case the other day. I did a, 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 a fireside chat with Steve, and he said the same thing. You know, he was really promoting the capital region as just such a powerful at, set of assets and base. Access to the, you know, we sit, we're sitting here a couple miles from the capital of the greatest nation in the world, you know? I, I think there's a lot to offer. I really do. Great. I think we have time for one more. Um, Sure, Randy DeMolke with Private Access Network. Yeah, thank you very much, George, for 
a great story. Yeah. So I'm curious as you looked around the country, as the other states and the programs that they had to foster development and entrepreneurship, were there any kind of no-brainer programs that you said, oh, this will be easy? Uh, you know, we just got a mimic this program in our state. It's a really yeah, good so I just want to the question is Randy asked is um, has George seen any other um, successful programs that we around the country that we might want to emulate yeah it's a really good question and we did a lot of benchmarking obviously as part of this study and and you know sometimes people tend to just jump off the page and say we got to be like Silicon Valley we got to be like Boston well come on you know it's gonna take a long time to garnish that Steve Case made a point the other day about venture capital and, and last year, 75% of that went to three cities, you know, and, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't here, you know, that percentage, we were low percentage. But, but some of the things we looked at, we looked at Georgia Research Alliance, right? We, we looked at things going on in Indianapolis and Pittsburgh. Every one, one common, in Boston and Silicon Valley too, but one of the common threads we saw was where innovation districts, flow of venture capital, creation of commercial opportunity was at its best was where there was a strong play by the private sector. Not, you know, you, I, I told people in Annapolis, right, I said, you don't, you don't legislate an ecosystem, right? You legislate an environment that helps one grow. And so we're trying to garnish more private participation. If you look at Boston and go back in history, and some of us remember what Kendall Square used to look like before it does today. And what happened there was the private sector. You know, Johnson & Johnson and partners got together with the university systems, and they built something called Lab Central. Right, that became the brand for an incubator for life science companies around the world. Maybe we get something like that here. And, and these are some of the things that we are working on. Stronger, better internship programs. Creative ways for skill development and, and workforce development. Co-investing in infrastructure. The Massachusetts Life Science Center, which put a billion dollars into play over five years, we studied them. Half of that money went to infrastructure. It was building places particularly on the life science side, where, where, where you can go. Um, so we're looking at doing more of that. Um, all those things share a mindset that I think we're evolving here. I think investment-wise and, and nuts and bolts-wise, it's, it's infrastructure. We've got to do a better job. At the end of the day, for all the entrepreneurs here and innovators, you have to be the center of our universe. It's not about us. It's not about Tedco. It's not about, it's about you. And how do we surround you with a, with a system and garnish and work together to make you great because if we do that, we'll all win. So, so it's a mindset of doing that. Wow, that's great, George. And with that, I just want to thank you for coming out and congratulations on all the great progress you're making at, at TEDCO. And uh, let's give it up for George. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you. That was fun. That was fun. And